hello everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. You know, if it wasn't already stressful enough to <laughs> live, <laughs> and then every time we also have the stress of of making it work from a technological perspective. So um, I think I'm going to need more fiber after that to restore my <laughs> gut bile. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm here with Dr. Well, you call yourself doctor, right? Because you have a PhD. So in, you're a doctor really that way. I mean, you have a doctor's title. I'm always. It depends. Little... Yeah. I mean, in academia, some people use it. I, yeah, I am. I have a doctorate. Yeah. So Dr. Holly Gans, <laughs> doctor <laughs> of microbes. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, uh, if you want to introduce yourself. For a second that would be great so people who haven't seen you before um which i highly doubt though but um just in case oh well hi everybody i'm holly gans i'm um, a microbial ecologist and what that means is that i think about how little tiny things that live inside animals but also like in the soil and other places interact with each other and um and i I'm really interested in how you can improve the diversity of these little communities inside the guts of cats and dogs. And I started a company a few years ago to try and help people with their pets and that company's animal biome. We do microbiome testing and then we are creating a range of supplements to help with gut health and skin health because gut microbiome affects lots of other things too. And I've got, I met, I met Odette, what, six, seven years seven, eight, almost eight years ago, right? 2017, seven years, almost seven just, years ago. Yeah, you had just started Animal yeah. Diet back then. At yeah. um, Dr. Suter at uh, the Holistic Veterinary Medical Association Conference. Right, exactly, exactly. And yes, we both have hats. So Holly showed up with her cat hat because she doesn't have her poop hat. And I decided exactly. well, I got to add mine. And I know some other people here, Michelle, <laughs> have poop hats too, though we can't see them. It might be worth wearing them because it probably will help with the absorption of the information that we're <laughs> going to share today. So today's subject is fiber. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit and explain a little bit what fiber are and what they do and what types of fibers and how they affect the entire body, et cetera, because there's definitely a lot more information that um, we have discovered, you know, in the last decades and, and certainly now more with a focus on the microbiome. Um, so we want to share a little bit about that because fiber is not just to get your animals to go to the bathroom on a regular basis. <laughs> it has <laughs> further reaching effects. Um, but I think what we need to start with first is to maybe define fiber a little bit and also how it's classified so that we have a little bit more information. So I just want to take this up front. It's going to, you know, fiber is really more, much more complicated. And you said it very beautifully earlier as we started talking. Um, so don't feel like you need to get all overwhelmed by it or anything, because in the end, um, so stay tuned for all the way to the end. <laughs> we will make it really simple as well. Uh, so anyway, so take it away, Holly, um, if you want, if you, I could talk a little bit about you know what fiber are and and yeah how they're kind of looked at awesome oh yeah i'll get us started um so yeah as as dr Suter mentioned right fiber is really helpful in promoting regular bowel movements and like we had we all know like our grandparents like to take metamucil and it helps them right and um and that's got psyllium husk in it but as we've started to learn more about the microbiome over the last what 15 years we've realized that fiber also is supporting bacteria in the gut microbiome, and it allows them to produce beneficial compounds. So what is fiber? And we'll talk about more about like the bacterial side of, and what results from that fermentation later on. But first, like what is fiber? Um, since I can't see your question, so I'm just going to go for it. And like, um, if anybody, if we ever want to ask people questions, let me know. Um, yeah. it's, a it's basically a type of carbohydrate that the body doesn't digest with its own enzymes. And um, so it, it, the body doesn't digest it on its own. And typically fibers are like long chains of monosaccharides that can be arranged in various ways. And the monosaccharide is things like glucose or fructose, so these, these simple sugars, but they're arranged in sort of a whole diversity of, of ways. 
And um, because of that, they um, it's very useful, I think, to classify or sort of divide up the different kinds of fibers by certain categories. And of course, we love, scientists love to do this, um, but we do it for a reason because it, it is useful. I know it can be a little bit, seem a little technical, but we're going to try and keep this simple, as simple as possible. So, but please ask us, stop us, ask questions along the way. I think we're going to see a nice figure soon. Um, so the way that fibers are usually described is in terms of how soluble they are, how viscous they are, and then how fermentable they are. And this, but this figure is really sh focusing on on solubility, because usually the viscosity and solubility are correlated anyway. So um, if it's highly soluble, it's things like, right, the, the, the um, one way to think about it is it's like highly soluble fibers include things like jams, right, jellies. They, you can imagine that they will go into water solution very easily, um, whereas something that has a low solubility would be like cellulose, right, like in lettuce, as an example. And then there are things that are in the middle that um, are more moderate solubility. So they, you know, will will dissolve in water to some extent. And that's things like right tomatoes and um, and yeah, I guess we've got pea hulls and pomace from grapes. Well, and, grapes um, are not supposed to be used for for animals, so <laughs> they probably yeah. didn't even be on that. And it was on an article yeah. the AVMA. Um, so, it was an AVM art. <laughs> I'm like, why do well, I know a lot of there? <laughs> a lot of these? Uh, um, yeah, you have to. There's so much nice um, literature on this for humans, but you do have to be really mindful that some of the um, dogs and cats can be um, like some of these plants are are poisonous or sort of toxic to them, and so uh, the I, have, I think some other examples I have for soluble fibers that you might be more commonly. Um, ex exposed to are things like oatmeal, chia seeds, nuts, beans, lentils, apples, and blueberries. I think, Dr. Cedar, you want to mention something about how foods with high solubility can be useful with for dealing with watery stool. Yeah. Did so you want to expand on that? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, let me just find my notes here because, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, brain. Uh, anyway, so the soluble fibers, because they dissolve in water, they also de then tend to bind more water to them. So they make a little bit more of like a gel kind of like substance, kind of like chia seeds, right? We know how chia seeds, when you soak them in water or flax seeds, if you soak them in water, uh, they become very um, gel-like. So they kind of give you like a gelatin sort of sense. And uh, so that would help to bind some of the water in the, in the poop, whereas uh, insoluble fiber, they tend to not dissolve in water, so they don't really bind to water either. Um, so in the sense, then they don't really relieve diarrhea, but they can be used as a uh, as a binding, uh, sorry, a bulking agent if an animal is constipated, for example, and to get things moving. So soluble fibers would be a little bit more for when they have diarrhea, so that thing, the water in the gut can bind to the fibers. And then the insoluble fiber would be a little bit more for uh, when they have constipation, for example, as a bulking um, agent. That's right. And I think when I was, you know, when I was, I used to run marathons and I would say that like sometimes I'd have sort of loose poops on race day because of nerves and, and and then you definitely want more of the soluble fiber and you kind of want to avoid before a long run those insoluble fibers like leafy greens because they can be a little more irritating when you're dealing with that kind of distress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah you so know. insoluble fiber, what are some examples of foods with insoluble fibers? I think that um, the list, well, I can, I can list some too, right? There were leafy greens on that. Um, there were this pistachio psyllium is is a moderate, I guess, soluble solubility. Mm -hmm. um, li like things like legumes, brown rice, like wheat bran, seeds, um, and things like the skins from like pears and apples, right, are mm -hmm. all good examples of foods that are insoluble. And um, and sometimes we like peel the apple and we don't eat the the the. Uh, skin but well, we really should because it's good for good for the gut mm -hmm. and then um we i think want to move into fermentability as the other sort of 
part of the that nice chart that you had. Mm-hmm. And that relates to how rapidly the bacteria in the gut are able to digest and break down that kind of fiber. And it really depends on both sort of the chemical structure of the molecule, um, right? So more complicated um, chemistries, right, can require more enzymes and like functions from the bacteria than more simple structures. And, um, and there's usually like, so there's usually also a relationship between solubility and fermentability, which you can see in that nice chart that like the stuff that's highly soluble also tends to be highly fermentable mm-hmm. up in the upper left, the fructose, the galactins, et cetera. And the things that are low in solubility are tend to also be low in fermentability, like cellulose, right? Some of these, um, you know, if you're eating wood right, or, or right. plants, like leafy greens. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, we need to kind of take into consideration that most foods and most, you know, plant-based foods do have a little bit of both of the you know, for, or are on the spectrum. So they have, they don't just have one type of fiber, they have multiple types of fibers and some are more fermentable, more soluble or less fermentable or less soluble as well. So um, they don't all fit into this nice little category because there's, there's just a variation of fibers that are present. Yeah, it's, it's super complicated because there's the chemistry really matters here. And Right, like, and food has a, a whole diversity of components to it. So, and then, yeah, nutrition is just very complicated. And then it changes, right, if it gets cooked or it's cooked and cooled. And I mean, like, there's just a lot of the there's a lot of chemistry here that does matter. Yeah, there was somebody who was asking about um, resistant starch and how that. Um, how that kind of goes into the into these categories. Yeah, I mean, resistant starch would be um, not soluble and have lower fermentability. Yeah, and there are even of- some that are like not fermentable either. Like mm-hmm. there's a whole all the way down to like the bacteria can't even do anything much with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because um, just for those who don't know what the, some of those resistant starch um, vegetables or fruits are, for example, green bananas have a lot of resistant starch in them. And then potatoes, if we cook the potatoes and then we let them cool down, they then have a lot more resistant starches in them as well. So if you're eating um, you know, cold potatoes, <laughs> you'll get more resistant starches. Also rice, like at, you cook the rice and you let it cool, then you get resistant starches. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how that, how the cooling process changes that. I can't quite yeah. get my head around it, <laughs> how it would have less or, or different type of starches, but probably it just rearranges the chemistry a little bit. That's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. So then I guess we can probably move on to what do these you know, what happens to these fibers in the, in the GI tract and dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. So I think it's easiest to start with the sort of the fast fermenting fibers. Like we talked about the fructose, the galactans, manins, the pectins, citrus pulp. Um, there's just, there's so many of these, it's hard to um, list them all, but, um, and other ones are like, right. FOS, right. GOS, MOS, inulin, right, that are, we might commonly see also. Mm-hmm. So FOS, the, would um, be beta- oligosaccharides, and then fructose. And then the other two are um, galacto oligosaccharides and mano oligosaccharides. Mm-hmm. So they're just different sugars that are kind of arranged differently in, in That's longer right. chains. And, and you and see a lot in like pre- probiotics, for example, like Saccharomyces boulardii has either FOS or MOS in them. Uh, so why yeah, they, actually, I guess why would they put these into into these um, into probiotics? Well, you know, we started doing it when we created RS boulardii. We did it. We initially um, did MOS. Now we have FOS. Um, 
actually initially we just did it because um, probiotics usually have to have a carrier in them. And we wanted the instead of having a carrier that might have negative side effects or that just wasn't beneficial, we, we actually chose a small amount of a prebiotic that could at least feed some gut bacteria that were beneficial. So that's one reason. And then because these prebiotics also have been shown to have benefits for the gut microbiome, like we've increased it so that it's a little bit more of a um, amount that actually can have a more significant effect. Um, so that's why we did it. I think there's other things like maltodextrin is one of the, is also like sort of on the list of fibers, but like not everybody likes it. Um, but that's usually used as sort of a carrier because you it, like the, when you grow up a probiotic, it comes at really concentrated and you have to like add something to it to get it to the concentration that you want. And it seems like why not have it be something that helps the microbiome. Mm. Interesting. Cause I was always, I mean, way back when I was under the impression that it was because it was nourishing the microbes that are in the capsule, but I mean, they're dry, so they're not really active at that point, but I guess you're sticking them into the gut and you're adding some food with them as well. Yeah, and I think it's you can call these things like they call them a symbiotic, where you're giving like the food for the microbe at the same time as the microbe. But we're really feeding the gut bacteria with the FOS more than the yeast mm. in the SBU. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, you were talking about the soluble fibers and how they, um, I mean, you mentioned earlier that they are more, more effective or more digested in the upper GI area because of their solubility can you kind of that's right that? yeah so these um fast fermenting fibers are, are basically they're well the fibers themselves are able to be fermented quickly so they call them fast fermenters but really the bacteria during the fermentation um they're easy source for gut bacteria and they'll sort of right away start to break them down in the small intestine and um and they start producing short chain fatty acids, which have many, many beneficial effects and um, which maybe we can spend a little time on. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of, that's really good and important thing. And it's really important to have fast fermenters in the, in the fiber blend that you're, or in the food that you're feeding. Um, the, the concern with having too much of a fast fermenter is that it can cause gas formation and increased flatulence. And in some really sensitive individuals, like there can be issues with that producing some digestive discomfort. So you don't want to overfeed the fast fermenters, though feeding them is in most healthy individuals, in healthy individuals is, is a good thing. And, um, and so I don't know, Dr. Suter, if you want to mention like what short chain fatty acids are doing in the gut, but one of the things that they do is they actually help to feed the, the intestinal cells and so that's really important, right, for maintaining a really healthy lining. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that the bacteria in the GI tract, um, if they don't have food in the form of fiber going through the system, they'll start to eat the mucus lining along the intestinal wall. And that um, it is not ideal because then basically can end up promoting leaky gut because as that mucus layer thins, then it's harder to keep pathogens out of the body because it's really protective. And short chain fatty acids also help um, the immune system to function, right? And that is actually very complicated and we could do like several, I think whole sessions on that. But yeah. any any top points you'd wanna make Dr. Suter about, about the immune response to these short chain fatty acids, which are things like butyrate, propionate, oh. acetate, yeah. there are a whole bunch of them. Yeah, I mean, definitely the point that, that I would like to make is that, you know, we think that fibers just act in the GI tract and then they go out and that's it. But because they are being processed uh, into something else by the bacteria or the microbes in general in, in the gut, um, they do have much further reaching effects. So, for example, butyrate, one of these short chain fatty acids that's being made not only affects the gut, but it also helps to regenerate the nerves. It helps to restore blood brain barrier, which keeps the brain safe from, you know, things going in that shouldn't be there and causing inflammation. It, it changes uh, neurotransmitter production in the brain. So it can have a calming effect, uh, for example. 
It can uh, diminish pain sensation. It can uh, induce brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is basically helping the brain and the cells in the brain, the ner nerves in the brain to, to grow and regenerate. And then I know you mentioned the immune system. There's a lot happening there too. They uh, can induce T regulatory cells. T regulatory cells are basically the cells of the you know, the immune system that help to regulate so that the immune system doesn't go too crazy or, you know, goes to sleep. So they help to modulate the immune system. But these uh, butyrate, for example, also suppresses pro-inflammatory um, issues. So it decreases inflammation and it also has antifungal properties, for example, for candida. Uh, so that's the immune system, and there's a whole lot more. I mean, this is so complex. I, I don't think anybody really has all the information. I certainly don't. <laughs> um, and then on a metabolic um, level, it also improves glycemic regulation. So it helps blood sugar regulation. It promotes weight loss. It can help with insulin resistance and, and mitochondrial function, right? We like mitochondria because that produces energy in the cells, um, and then cells function better, and then if the cells function better, everything can function better. And if the mitochondria aren't working properly, then we're kind of moving more into a direction of dysfunctional cells that can then eventually become cancerous. Um, satiety is also um, affected by butyrate, um, leptin, and then from a cardiovascular perspective, there is some help that butyrate is contributing as well. And yes, from a cancer level, it also represses cancerous cell expansion, meaning growth and then metastasis as well. So basically it's it's so far reaching. And so we, when we look at fiber, we really have to have a little bit of awe, you know, of, of how they can be processed. And of course our little microbes uh, need to be present for that to happen properly. But I was just thinking this morning with microbes, there are workers, right? So we need to feed the workers so that they can do the work because if we don't feed them, they can't do the work and then everything else doesn't happen. So um, okay. that's kind of, you know, my two cents on on that just to explain how how important it is. That's right. And there was a, there was a really interesting study that the Sonnenberg lab at Stanford did where they it was sort of looking at the fast food diet um, and versus a high fiber Mediterranean diet and um, where they found they actually looked at like the gut lining. I mean, this was a mouse study. So they actually anyway, they were able to look at things we wouldn't do for dogs or cats um, or people. But um, and they they actually showed that the, you know, when the bacteria start to starve, when you're not giving them any fiber, they really do. Some of them will start to eat the mucus and you mm -hmm. can really see it thin dramatically and then it starts to like allow um, bacteria and, and chemicals to, or uh, chemicals um, molecules that the body doesn't really want to get through that gut lining to start to pass through right right and uh, butyrate or the short chain fatty acids also uh, regulate the ph in the gut um, i'll let you take it from there <laughs> Oh yeah, there's some fibers, right, that like have more of an effect than others. Actually, I'm not sure I'm remembering the examples. I was reading about that. That the so yeah, I'm not as I think I might um, defer the whole pH part of the story to you, but it's it's really interesting and it is important. But it's not um, I'm not probably as up on it as I should be. Yeah. Um, not a nutritionist, so you're you know you're in the hands of a microbiologist and a veterinarian <laughs> today. <laughs> so yeah, to those who know nutrition. It. Forgive us. <laughs> yeah, we have a certain it. angle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, what I read is that because the pH has to be a little bit more acidic in the colon, um, because when we start with a very acidic pH in the stomach, and then it becomes more neutral or alkaline in the small intestine, and then as it goes further back towards the rear end, it becomes more um, acidic again. The pH not not nearly as much as it was in the stomach. But what the acidic pH helps to do, it helps to keep some of the pathogenic microbes in check so that we don't have such amount of overgrowth of clostridium and, and E. coli and these types of things in the, in the large intestine. And so um, that's what these short chain fatty acids also do. 
they help to produce the butyrate and the acetate and propionate, which then decreases the pH and then limits the, oh, the growth of, of some of these more pathogenic microbes. And as you mentioned, if we don't have bacteria eating the, the mucus, um, then we have a good protection. And because anytime we the mucus gets dissolved or eaten up, then pathogenic microbes can get into the the uh, you know the inside of the body into this into the system and cause toxicity and inflammation there. So it really plays a huge role in in regulationing regulation regulating or preventing really the the inflammation in the body. Yeah. So the these short chain fatty acids are acids, and so they do um lower the pH after when they're produced mm -hmm. and. Um, one thing I was reading about is like why you want to have a balance of the, the fast fermenters and the slower fermenters is that you're going to get this big pulse of like short chain fatty acid production with the, the high, highly fermentable or fast fermenting fibers, but they, their amount that passes through the system is going to go down at, because it's, it's used by the body and by these bacteria very quickly. And so by having a blend that has of fibers that differ in how fermentable they are, more of that will get to the lower intestine and be able to be used there. And will probably also contribute to that having a lower pH. You, you know, when you're talking about it, it reminded me, I used to work on crazy things like vultures and wildlife and um, vultures have really, really acidic stomachs, like in, the, in their crops and in their stomachs because they eat like dead things, right? And they have to, they have to figure out how to eat dead things and not die. And so that is a really important way that the body is able to like neutralize some pathogens. And so it's, it's an important strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because we have, we, there are different microbes in the small intestine than there are in the large intestine. And if all these small intestinal microbes would be migrating into the large intestine, then that could potentially cause issues in that neighborhood. That's right. And the, the pH is really important in affecting like what bacteria can live where is really um, mm. heavily regulated by pH mm. or the acidity mm. of that environment is really important to bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we look at the small intestine, we have more of the um, fast soluble fibers that are fermented there. But I also see animals that don't do very well with fiber. And you mentioned earlier that they can have a little bit of, um, you know, potentially a little bit of adverse effects as in causing gas. So what, what, how would you explain what's, what's happening there and, and why that is happening? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's complicated because I think it really depends on the composition of bacteria that are in the, in the GI tract. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you have a, diverse and balanced microbiome in your gut, then you may not have as much issue with fast fermenting fibers causing gas than someone. So it really kind of depends on the balance of what's there because it's, it's like a ecosystem. The slow fermenting fibers are um, also really important, right? Cause you need to get things down to feed the bacteria in the, right? In the different parts of the colon and um, in the large intestine and those are different things, right? Like we mentioned, the whole grains, right? Wheat, rye, barley, rolled oats are um, slower fermenters. Um, cellulose in plants, like you know, leafy greens. Um, I think those can also be sort of irritating. It depends on sort of what's going on with the system, right? If the system inflamed and already having loose stool and you add low fermenting fibers, it's actually gonna make that worse. And so having more soluble and higher fermentability is, can be soothing. So it's, it's kind of a complicated balance. Yeah, yeah. And I think in, in the human field, it's, it's really, uh, I think they've done more exploration in the human field with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, but I don't think it quite relates, at least from what I've read, it doesn't quite relate the same to animals because, or dogs, especially because um, from what I remember reading, it's like some dogs can have more bacteria in the small intestine and still be healthy, whereas others have less. So we can't really quite call it the same, but I would still think that there's 
a bit of something like that going on too in, in dogs and well, I don't know about cats, but dogs for sure. We don't know that I mean, they have cats, right? <laughs> That's the problem. I think we've, we've probably both looked inside the GI tract. Um, I've done some postmortems. Anyway, um, and you know, the small intestine is white, it's more yellow and it's usually more like, um, it doesn't have like a lot of biomass of like material mm -hmm. in it all the time, or it's, it's like got this mucus lining and like, and it's really, things tend to sit a lot longer in the colon mm -hmm. and you, and so they're, they are sort of the, how long the food ball is spent in the different part of the parts of the GI tract is also probably a factor too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, definitely. I mean, if an animal is sensitive to fiber, certainly starting slow, you know, with only a little bit and slowly getting them used to it would probably be helpful. And also trying to figure out which fiber work better, you know, maybe try more of the soluble fibers. And then if that doesn't work, try more of the insoluble fibers, because I guess that could also give you a bit of an indication of where the problem actually is. Because if they have more problems with the soluble fiber, it would probably be more of a small intestinal issue. Whereas with the others, it would be more in the large intestine. That's right. I mean, I think it's good to have a blend, but um, yeah, there, I wouldn't be afraid of the fast fermenting fibers because they, in most individuals are beneficial, mm -hmm. but Less is more. It's always good to start with just a small amount, see how they do. And then you can always increase it, you know, to the recommended amount mm -hmm. over time. You don't have to like, it's not like, um, like a pharmaceutical, right? Where you, there's like, you need to do this amount, you know, like to have it have an F be mm -hmm. effective. Like they will respond, like the system will respond to small increases and that can give you a chance to sort of see. Right, if there's a bunch of bacteria waiting, <laughs> if there's too many of a certain kind of bacteria in the small intestine and they are gonna go crazy in response to those, you'll find out by just adding a little bit, right, over time, just like you suggested, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess just kind of moving into nutrition just a little bit, uh, like a side note, uh, when you look at the label of your pet food, it usually lists fiber as crude fiber. And the crude fiber is really the more undigestible, you know, poorly soluble, um, slow fermenting sort of fiber. And they don't list the other because I believe it would take a whole lot more um, money to actually <laughs> determine how much of the other fiber are in the food because they'd have, you know, for testing purposes. Uh, so you can always sort of assume that most likely if you double the amount to that of crude fiber, that's probably more of the actual fiber that's in the food. But, you and know, it, is. Hmm. I'm just going to add that it's always good to look at the ingredients, right? And see if it includes some of these examples of sort of the fibers that are either high or moderate or low in fermentability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then obviously the question of the day would be also how, what do you see when, you know, let's just say you take a a, a, peep, a poop sample from a dog, and then you're you're doing the testing, and then you're seeing that it's imbalanced. What do you what where do you go from there as far as you know fiber is concerned, or what what are some of the things that you see? You know, because there are are the camps who say, well you should be feeding fiber. And then there's the other camp who says you should not be feeding fiber. They don't need it. So what, what do you see in these microbiome results? Because I know you, you take a lot of information from people. Uh, you make us fill out like a huge questionnaire <laughs> to send <laughs> it in. And um, so what, what do you see? Yeah, this is, um, this is great. So well, I, um, just for context, like the reason I have like this cheetah hat is because I, I was working for a while on cheetahs with a veterinarian in, in Southern Africa. And he was really promoting whole carcass nutrition for cheetahs. So I guess there are some places that in Southern Africa where they have cheetahs and they were just literally feeding them like muscle meat from donkeys. And it isn't one, it's not like nutritionally complete for them, but also it doesn't have any of the fiber that they would naturally get from a carcass when they were actually, if they actually were able to be wild and 
hunt for themselves, they would be eating right the skin and the feathers and they would, they often will eat some of the gut contents of grazing animals, which have lots of fermented plant material in there. And so if, if you're trying to do sort of prey model diet, it's, I think it's just people forget about that part of it because it's not easy, right? It's not really easy to get like fur and feathers and like, you know, tripe and, um, and the sort of contents of the gut of like, you know, um, dead animals. But then, so this is where you can use fiber to sort of add a little bit of that. And you don't really need a lot, but you do need to have some. Mm -hmm. And um, what we see when we look at the microbiome of sort of some of the more, um, and I actually think also it's like maybe there is some fiber in the diet, but some individuals might need more fiber than others. Mm -hmm. We're all different. Um, the microbiome is like a unique fingerprint. We really try and look at what's like common across dogs and cats, so and like both healthy and sick ones, so that we can try and help push it to a healthier state for those that are having issues because we um, find this tool to be helpful. Usually if they're fed a high protein, so usually we do want them to have a high protein diet. It's more beneficial than having a high carbohydrate diet for cats and dogs. Um, and so we do like to see like fusobacterium levels being, you know, like in the moderate range. But if it's really high and we don't see um, certain groups that are associated with sort of fiber fermentation, we usually recommend adding things like, you know, FOS or inulin or, I mean, psyllium, any, like there's a whole range of things that you can very easily get and add, or you can just add some vegetables to your, you know, your diet. And, um, and then we start to see actually beneficial groups like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium will increase. Um, if like things like C. perfringens is too high, C. C perf is a, is an interesting group because um, for a while, there was thought that maybe it was causing GI issues. And so there, it's included in a lot of diagnostic panels. But now we know that it is half of healthy dogs have it. And mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's I think it's just, it's something that I think when the microbiome is depleted, it can become problematic, but it, having it there is normal. And so you can also increase the diversity and the different kinds of bacteria in the gut by adding small amounts of fiber. But you don't want to like go crazy and add like, tablespoons of it you just want like a quarter teaspoon it's a great place to start for for dogs if you add it it will decrease per c perf and it also will decrease e coli because it's feeding other bacteria that are able to compete with them mm -hmm. and um and we already mentioned like it'll help with the pr production of the short chain fatty acids which like will help uh, like this helps that whole community of bacteria that like to produce those beneficial compounds flourish Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also found that it like um, it helps to reduce the amount of ammonia that goes that goes into the body. So that's also beneficial in keeping toxins out. Um, I think we mentioned also there's um, yeah other benefits. Do you want to talk more about the microbiome side of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to think. With so there's definitely like the other groups that are involved with resistant starches that um, like so ruminococcus is one that will go up with resistant starch. Um, the calibacterium is, is a group that I really love too. It seem, and um, it does well with resistant starches. And um, there are some in humans that are really important, but that we haven't really found to be important in dogs like acromantia. So for yourself, like it's good to, it's good to have some resistant starch because that's a group that um, people think is really important for longevity in people. Mm -hmm. um, they also like the um, they get like different kinds of I guess resistant starches and oligosaccharides um, and then there's like for polysaccharides we've got cellulose hemicellulose, pectins, fructans and these hydrocolloids and those can be found in so things like bran like um, bran tissues, whole grains Vegetable skins, better not to peel them, like good to eat them. Mm -hmm. uh, pectins come in things like apples, right? Which I'm a huge apple fan. I do like to eat this. I eat the, the whole apple. Um, oh, yeah. Apples can be kind of a good example of like when they're raw, you get a lot more out of it than if you like cook it down from the point of view of feeding the gut bacteria. Um, things with the polyfructose, which is like the chains of fructose, there are things like chicory, artichokes, um, 
we don't feed onions to our dogs, but for us, that's what's in there. And then, um, and then those these hydrocolloids hydroco- are interesting because they're kind of like these gummy mucilaginous stuff that, um, so that's like aloe vera, right? It's also there in legumes and um, some fruits and vegetables and nuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there are definitely a lot of um, different things that can affect it. And so people are asking here, you know, what did you say to add to decrease uh, Clostridium perfringens and E. coli? Um, uh, well, I think, I mean, uh, adding fiber in general will do that. So, and it, it, there's, it, I think can be, it depends where in the gut you're trying to like resolve it, but the, the best approach would be to have a mixture of like high and low fermented fiber so that like, cause you don't know, cause E. coli can colonize all the way from the mouth down into the colon. And unless you like are able to, you know, have a, a lens into where in the GI tract it's a problem, mm-hmm. it's best to have a blend of fibers. Right, exactly, exactly. And we did talk about, you know, where which fiber gets digested a little bit more for those who are asking. So if you weren't here in the beginning, we talked about that. Uh, you can rewatch it. Uh, but yeah, in general, you know, I, we were talking about fiber being so complex and, and being a big subject and such, but I don't want what I'm seeing in the comments here. Everybody is now getting all complicated. <laughs> and like, what do I use? It is complicated. And, I don't want you to get stuck with that because nature provides us with such a variety of vegetables, fruits, you know, greenery, everything. And it gives us seasonal things as well. So go with that, you know, go with seasonal, what's available and go with, you know, what's growing in your area as well. Uh, You know, obviously in the Chicago area, not a whole lot is growing in the wintertime. um, So we do have to import it from somewhere else, but you know, kind of try to stick as much to locally grown things, you know, what grows in that neighborhood, seasonal, um, organic, uh, preferably, of course. And then also listen to your animals, because there are some dogs who love vegetables and they love fruit and others are like, do not feed me that. So yeah. go with what your animals are telling them, uh, telling you as well, because there's no one size fits all. That's why, why there's 20,000 different diets for you in the human field and we know we try to kind of make it the same in the animal field as well but there is no such thing as a one size fits all of course you know the more processed the worse it is i mean that's the same in humans if you eat mcdonald's all day long then you know you're going to probably turn into a hamburger uh, that's never going to break down um (laughs) but in any case don't make it too complicated you know especially if your animals are doing well if they don't have any gi issues just continue feeding them and and let them choose you know you can also put some vegetables on like a blanket or something and then see which one they go for because they are very good at, at picking what they want and you know some animals will eat grass outside they're like cows. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go get myself some grass without having GI issues. So, just, okay. you know, keep it simple. You know, don't make it complicated. But I wanted you to have that information about what fibers do and, and how complex they are and how important they are and how far reaching their effects are so that you just have a little bit more information in that and can also use it for, you know, if your animals have some GI issues. So. Anyways, that's my little soapbox. <laughs> hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's, it's great to add some vegetables, but you don't need to add that many. But And then you're right, like some of them, like I used to feed my dogs this uh, uh, food that had like green beans in it. And one of the dogs like loved it and the other one would pick them out and put mm-hmm. them on the floor, a little pile of green beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have them <laughs> it's like people you know they go to a restaurant and eat you know they get different things and I'm like do you want my beets you know for my salad <laughs> here you go piling them and they're they're giving me something that I like but they don't you know so it's um, we just have to be kind of you know flexible that way uh, because I think the body knows best but I remember uh, a few years ago I, I was recruiting a new donor dog for my practice and I did a fecal uh, fecal test with you guys and you had you looked at at the results and you said no I would not use him for a donor and he had been on a 
you know, prey model diet. So he probably just didn't get enough fiber. And I did see the difference when, because I had started using him a little bit beforehand because, uh, you know, you guys came kind of on the market <laughs> freshly. Um, uh, and I didn't see the results that I used to see with my previous donor. It just, his poop was not nearly as good. Uh, so I stopped using him, of course. But um, I think, you know, in the end, the proof is in the pudding. That's right. And I do think like, um, we're not saying like you should just feed vegetables either, right? Like we, you don't want to have a balanced diet with enough protein for sure, but a little bit of fiber can go a long way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, these microbes, I mean, they make what like of a, I think in humans, they say it's about two kilograms of, of microbes in the gut of a human, right? That so, sounds right. It's been a minute since I looked at that. Yeah. Um, so obviously in a chihuahua, you probably would only have, I don't know, maybe 100 grams at the most. <laughs> well, probably not even that. Maybe 50 grams. I don't know how much that is in ounces. I really have not been able to convert to the American <laughs> system. But in any case, it wouldn't be that much. So you have to sort of adjust to the size of the dog as well and dogs and cats GI tract is also much shorter than a human's so they probably have less microbes just because of that as well because there's just less volume um that and the transit time is much faster yeah, yeah. and that matters for how long the bacteria have to, mm -hmm. to ferment the food yeah so then the amount that they would need is probably smaller because they have less microbes i mean they still have a gazillion of them and we do need to feed them um, but it's probably not quite like us where, you know, I thrive on salads. <laughs> I've got a big bowl of salad, in, you know, um, I mean, you give that to a dog. They're like, mm, I don't think so. Um, yeah. And, and they, they're not going to do as well just having low fermentable fibers, like, cause it's yeah. not going to stick around like as long as it will in us. And we don't do as well as like a horse or a cow. Yeah, exactly. Where they, they hold the food and it gives it the, the, the microbes time to ferment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the problem with the low digestible or low soluble fiber or fermentable fiber is also that they can hold on to nutrients that the body actually would need. So giving too much of that could potentially bind nutrients that the body can then not absorb because they are being bound to these fibers. So uh, it's, you know, all in moderation, like with everything. Um, yeah. So any, uh, let me just see if there are any other questions that I uh, missed here. Um, oh yeah, there was somebody who asked what would make the stool um, smell so foul? Um, so that's sort of like a putrefying bacteria thing. Um, I think that it's definitely a sign that the GI, there's an issue in the microbiome for one thing. Um, I don't know if I, you have a better, uh, or more th like more to add Dr. Suter with that. I just know that it's usually, there's usually something wrong when it should not smell foul. Yeah. Yeah. If, if the animal clears the room, <laughs> when they pass gas, that is not normal. Um, definitely. <laughs> that is not normal. They shouldn't have uh, that kind of smell <laughs> coming from them and smell, you know, bad smelling poop is also not, not uh, normal. So definitely looking at the microbiome, doing some testing to see what might be going on there and, and you know, possibly cleaning up the diet. Maybe they're sensitive to something that you're feeding them. You know, they can't tolerate it well and creates inflammation and more gas, uh, overgrowth of microbes, et cetera. Um, yeah. And since you mentioned donors, like we, you know, we, we have a bunch of donors for our, our um, mm -hmm. legal transplant capsules and I have rejected donors just based on the way the poo smelled. Like the microbiome might look fine. The, the fecal consistency might be fine, but if it just doesn't smell right, I just don't. I also just have a smell test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to have some people with good noses <laughs> around. <laughs> well, that reminds me of a movie that I watched a very, very long, well, a long time ago, but it was from the, I don't know, few hundred years ago. Uh, there was this nun who uh, had gone into medicine, you know, so she was doing like the, you know, medicine that they used back then. And uh, they they also used taste testing. 
<laughs> well, she had had a little affair on the side, even though she was not supposed to. And so she tested her urine and it smelled, you know, she could tell that it, there was some, you know, that she's pregnant, basically, based on that. So I think that smell is definitely plays a big role. And uh, one of my um, clients, she has 11 dogs. Um, she's here too today. <laughs> uh, but one of her dogs, who is usually the fecal donor for another dog, uh, you know, like on a regular daily basis as an oral fecal donor. Um, he had a dental and for a few days after that, her other dog would not eat his poop. So probably, That's good. Uh, you know, from the anesthesia drugs and such that uh, were kind of coming out. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question here. Another new trend in feeding pets. Um, What's the other part? How does it play into the evolution of carnivore diets? Okay, I'm not sure there's only half the. Let me see if there's another part to this. I'm not sure. Well, just that I think we sort of spoke to that and that um, wild carnivores that are killing their prey are eating fiber. Mm, yeah. Maybe it was uh, had more to do with you know now having uh, people using some vegetarian diets for for their animals. Oh yeah. What, what do you yeah. see? have you done any fecal uh, testing on some of these dogs and can you comment to to that? Like the well, ones that are fully vegetarian, like no meat, no. Yeah, I we did do um, some studies for wild earth that we talked about publicly, so I can share. Um, where like I think if there's enough protein in the we think, I mean, there's a lot more nutri um, um, nutrition is so complicated. So in general, we think that what we're seeing with microbiome responses is partly at the macronutrient level. And it, well, if we want to get into like these nitty gritty, right, of the complexity of the structure of the food, which does matter, um, you have to do like a lot of careful experiments, which haven't really been done yet. So when I read the nutrition literature for the microbiome, mostly it seems at this sort of very high level, like how much protein, how much fiber, how much carbohydrate, how much water. Um, and so there, like, I think that you can create a, I mean, in that case, it's a fungus that's being used to make the protein. Um, you can create a diet that is plant or fungal based that has enough protein. And it does seem to support diversity and like a bacteria in the gut. And they can look similar to other healthy dogs. We don't know, like, long term like I mean it's I you know think that these diets are interesting I don't feed them to my dogs but um but they you know they are do they do studies to make sure that they are able to meet the nutritional requirements yeah and yeah I think there's a there's a lot more studying that needs to to be happening to know for sure but generally uh, I'm not a big fan of vegan diets for for a carnivore I mean, they're not obligate carnivores. Dogs are not not like cats um, who are, but uh, feeding them a vegetarian diet, I think a lot of dogs would also object to that because they're like, yeah, I'm not eating that. Forget it. <laughs> because they don't have, well, yeah, they have different taste buds than we do anyway. Um, and I, I am more, yeah, they do. That's true. I mean, I do think these like fungal-based ones are kind of more interesting to me than vegetable-based proteins, but because yeah. I'm kind of on a mushroom kick. Oh, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you'll have to wear a mushroom hat next time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then, um, what is the opinion of bones as a fiber source? Well, it very much depends. I mean, if they actually eat the whole bone or if they just chew on it. Um, <clears throat> I, I would know, view that as insoluble, right? <laughs> Low fermentable. Um, but can I think some of it right would be natural, and they they can handle having some of it pass through for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> Michelle, the proof is in the poo day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, all right. Anyways, let me see if there are any other questions. Um, fiber. Uh, yeah. So anyways, from what I've read in the literature is that, you know, accurate, I mean, dosing of fiber is not very 
well-defined. Um, it's really more, you know, how does an animal do with it? Um, and so it's a bit of a trial and error thing and probably quite individual. Um, and then uh, can you give an example of an ideal blend of fibers using whole foods for a dog? Like asparagus and then what else? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, what are some good things for, I mean, like the fast fermenters are like um, usually a little bit more pro processed, right? Like the apple pomace, the carrot pomace, pectins, right? Like there's been some cooking done to make them more fast fermenting. Um, moderate fermenters are a little bit easier, right? Because then you get like pectin and flaxseed. Um, whole, I mean, like it's it's very easy to do like the, I think the plant material though, like leafy greens, legumes, those would be something that are whole foods mm. that you could add. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my go-tos are again, you know, what vegetables are growing right now and then eat those, yeah. you know? And so I, I usually recommend a blend of different, of a multitude of, of things, because if you look at how an animal moves around in nature, a dog, for example, I mean, cats, obviously they will eat their prey more so than actual, uh, you know, greenery. But if you look at the mouse, for example, the mouse went all over the place and ate all kinds of things. And then the cat gets that. And with the dogs, you know, with the wild, you know, wolves and such, they were going around and they were just picking up things because they were traveling. So they weren't eat always on in the same area. So they would eat a multitude of things. And I think in humans too, they say you should eat up to 30 to 40 different type of, you know, fruits and vegetables. And that includes uh, herbs as well. And I can't remember the exact um, number, but I don't, and I don't remember if it was daily or per week or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember, but variety is just important. You know, right now dandelions are out. So get some dandelion greens. And then what else? Yeah. I have some chicory salad that's already growing. Um, I have some herbs that are already growing and and then find I mean, what you can find at the store too, different things, celery, chai, uh, chard, um, cauliflower, you know, just a variety. Don't stick with only just two vegetables. There's more than just broccoli and green beans. That's right. And peas. People often do peas too. Mm -hmm. um, you can do like, yeah, a little bit of apple, right, to get some of the high fermenter, a little strawberry, blueberry, if you want. Yeah, yeah, just some variety, you know, because we yeah, humans that, like variety too, and animals like variety as well. Um, they don't need to be on the same kibble, the same brand, the same protein for their, their entire life. Just give them variety, and maybe you it will get you to explore a little bit more variety as well, you know. Yeah, I think seasonal That's eating, like go to the farmer's market, see what's in season and use that as a guide. Yeah. It's, yeah. it. there's definitely research showing that like our gut microbiomes are better off if we, if we change what we eat across the seasons. Yeah, yeah. And what I like to do with, with vegetables and fruits and such, because GI, the GI tract of dogs and cats is shorter, I like to... Um, stick them in the blender and blend them up so that they can actually get a bit more nutrients out of it and fiber too. Because for example, if you feed a dog, you give them a carrot, you're going to see pieces of carrot coming out the rear end. And that also means that the fiber in that carrot was not accessible to the animal because it just goes right. through the process. So you want to uh, definitely break it down somewhat because that's what they would do in the wild. If they eat a prey animal, they would eat the GI content that's already uh, partially broken down so you want to mimic what's happening in nature as much as possible and just stay flexible stay open and you know listen to your animals yeah a little bit of cooking can help make these more available like corn and also carrots apples depends on mm -hmm. um, if you cook for your pet yeah yeah exactly all right i think we kind of did the round on on fiber here Although there's definitely always more to talk about, but I personally have found it a little challenging, you know, the, the subject of fiber to kind of figure out how it's classified because it's classified so in such different ways and it's really complicated and complex. And um, 
Yeah. Are polyphenols, do you know, are they considered fiber too or part of fiber? I know they're good nutrients. They're, I mean, they're considered yeah. prebiotic, but I don't know if they're considered a fiber. Maybe it's probably a good question. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. But polyphenols yeah. come with fiber, obviously, like yellow, or, or sorry, orange, carrots, red beets, purple, blueberries. So you get a lot of polyphenols as well. And these polyphenols are really good for the gut microbiome as well. They're, you know, good prebiotics. For, for humans, I highly recommend chocolate because chocolate is one of the best polyphenols possible. Obviously, stay away from, I mean, don't give it to your animals, but uh, for humans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so i guess the, i think in, in some it's like plants are our friends and we should definitely use diversity of them and and we need to give some to our our cats and dogs too i mean less to cats probably but yeah yeah all right very good well thank you so so much holly for, for being here on a sunday morning i know it's earlier for you being in california so thanks for for getting up but you know you've got your hat so you know if you had bed hair that kind of covers it up that's what I do <laughs> that's right. my hair is all wild I just put my hat on for a while and then it's all flatter <laughs> but anyways it's, it's cute your little cat or your cheetah hat all right I'll get my poop hat for next time yeah 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 well it's good to have a variety you know I should I should get a few more hats different kinds all right. Anyways, everyone, it, it was great hanging out with you. Thanks for, for being here and listening in and learning. And good luck with all the veggies. Um, your animals will probably or maybe or maybe not appreciate it. Who knows? <laughs> Depending on the animal. Um, but I'm sure that your refrigerator will look a lot more green and colorful. Um, actually, I have a funny story. One of my neighbor's kids, she came over and she looked in my fridge and said, why is everything green in there? <laughs> uh, so anyway all right well have a nice sunday everyone and um we'll see you soon bye bye